Um, I wish I could have been here today, but it's probably almost as good as the real thing. Um, I, I was realized, to sh uh, I was shocked to realize that this is my 10th tuning speculations, which is <laughs> really old. Uh, I mean, I've only missed a handful of these, always regrettably, uh, but I think that this year's theme, uh, re-detuning speculation, is a really important one given the current state of the world and of things um, after 12 years of Trumpism. And yes, I'm counting the, the last four years of his post fleshlight hollow presidency. Um, I think that we're all fucking ready for the post truth era to, to be over, to go back to pre truth or to truth or something. Um, but I'm worried that the ascendancy of, of the post presidential algorithmic governance that's created has created even this, even murkier conditions for accountability. Uh, given that the phenomena tech that are available to us right now aren't yet, and I'm, not, I'm worried we'll never really be powerful enough to parse all of the modeled uh, reality-based decisions that it's, it's creating. Um, so I was going to revisit my paper from uh, 2016 about Black MIDI, but I thought it was more appropriate to, well, flip the spectrum and think about white noise. Uh, so what I want to do today is try to connect a few nodes from in, in and around the past, uh, around the post-truth era that I think can help us locate the rise of phenomena tech in what for centuries was known as music. So obviously I'm playing here, uh, of course music hasn't been zeroed any more than any other sort of flesh sense experience. Uh, but in fact I, I recently saw that there's been a fourfold net increase in environmental sound this year. Um, it, the vast majority of which was on account of the resurgence in audible music. And I, I've also been finding it really interesting to observe the rise of these, uh, 128, these 128 kbps uh, speaker parties that have been popping up <clears throat> where this nostalgia for the digital, it, uh, the, uh, this digital past is being played out on top of this already curious persistence of analog media. Um, so I just, I, I, I thought I'd pause just to say that I think it's really appropriate to thematize this year um, around the return of the digital, as, as tuning speculations has. Uh, I'm not fully sold that the uh, idea of digital encoding represents an opportunity to think deceleration on account of its relatively clunky procedures of binary encoding, but that's just me. Uh, in any case, I, I, um, this is all going to feel a little bit slow to you, this uh, you know, 2D, 3D, sonic, PowerPoint, AD stuff. Uh, but you know, I think it's really refreshing to reconnect uh, not just with archaic media, but also with these states of reception that we've <clears throat> more or less completely left behind. Um, but back to music. I, I think that there's a really convincing case to be made that the folding of flesh sets into the virtually non-virtual phenomena technologies of today closely follows the arc of music silencing. Now it probably sounds arbitrary to be talking about music or to prioritize the sonic, given the complete collapse of all sensorial distinction under a, a mediated experience. But I'd argue that the seeds of post-sensorial technologies sprouted in the furrow between what Francois Bonnet called the audible and the sonorous, the former referring to the propagation of physical forces that affect hearing, uh, and the latter to the economy of sense, memory, sociality, etc., in which sound circulates, albeit potentially in silence. So where I'm not going to begin is 1952 with the first performance of John Cage's 433, but it's probably telling that I've already grudgingly begun here. Um, well over a hundred years later, Cage's silent piece still gets snickers when my students port to the famous micro -long, microsecond long 2021 version uh, performed over three weeks by, Octa <coughs> by Octavia, Mark, Ma Octavia Mach, even though many of them have never experienced anything but silent music. It's a shame to start, at the, to start at the, after the beginning insofar as beginnings are generally bullshit anyway, because to be brief, one, Cage's silent piece was actually about sound, not silence, and um, uh, 19, two 19th century French humorist Alphonse Allais, who counted the trickster Eric Satie as an acolyte, composed a much earlier silent work, Marche funèbre composé pour les funérailles d'un grand homme sourd, a piece consisting of 24 blank bars in 1897. Uh, the idea of silent music, perhaps because it is, or I guess was, a uh, seemingly contradiction in terms, was often penned facetiously. There's a, you can take the apocryphal work by Paul Hindemith, consisting of nothing but rests and fermata, for example, uh, which was uh, composed in 1916, apparently, when John Cage was four years old and probably refused to eat mushrooms. <laughs> <coughs> Both Allais and Hindemith didn't seem to give a shit whether or not, the music, whether or not these works were actually performed. 
Uh, but does, this does that make these works any less musical than Cage's score for 433? It's possible, because what 433 did was reinscribe music silence within the audible. So if music doesn't require audible sound, but that even the best known musical silence was audible, then what is it we have understood music to be for so long? It seems a strange question to ask now that the word music is so deeply inflected with nostalgia. Christopher Small gave this provocation in 1998. Quote, there is no such thing as music, end quote. It's hard to tell whether he meant this ironically or not. Small's move ostensibly was to shift our conception of music away from its objecthood into its performance and reception. Quote, music is not a thing but an activity, something people do. The apparent thing music is a figment, an abstraction of the action whose reality vanishes as soon as we examine it closely, end quote. So that's fine, music is relational. But then how did we use to decide what counted as music if its contours had become articulated by practice and not by sound? So I'm going to put aside uh, musicological and philosophical questions for a moment to consider how we find phenomenotech prefigured in a different sort of silencing, one that occurred at the receptual locus of, music's, uh, of music as it moved away, uh, moved away from the ear to the brain, a shift that began first as metaphor. Inaudible music, to use an awkward phrase, didn't just happen when it did because of technological advances in neural porting and algorithmic post-sensory aesthetics. It was presaged uncannily in J.G. Ballard's 1960 short story, The Sound Sweep, a tale about an orally, dis orally, orally dystopic future in which noise pollution and unwanted sounds are things of the past thanks to a device called the Sonovac. In Ballard's story, an underclass of, vac of workers vacuums up sonic detritus while a docile consumer is pacified by silent musical entertainment. Quote, Ultrasonic music employed a vastly great ring, uh, greater range of octaves, chords, and chromatic scales that are audible by the human ear, provided a direct, direct, link, a direct neural link between the sound stream and the auditory lobes, generating an apparently sourceless sense, uh, a sensation of harmony, rhythm, cadence, and melody uncontaminated by the noise and vibration of audible music." End quote. But even though ultrasonic music is silent, it still manifests as music as we knew it. That is, it's still pr parameterized by the codes of Western tonality, rhythm, etc. It's not apparent to the ear, but is there really any difference if it's manifest in the mind? Is it still music? For one thing, the ear isn't the only body part involved in hearing. An ultrasonic dance party is, is as libidinal as a gut, and gut-based as a headphone rave. It's also every bit as social. Ballard's hyperstitioning of our post-sensorial present found a more literal and material manifestation in and around the same time in the work of, of uh, Manfred, L. E Manfred L. Eaton. Writing in at the end of the 60s, Eaton claimed that he began his research into what he called biomusic, which began in 1960, the same year in which Ballard's story was published. Eaton's Orcus Research Group apparently developed a system that would turn the entire body both into a generator and a receiver of new forms of a musical experience. <coughs> By applying an array of bioelectric technologies to a body, a subject could be inserted into a cybernetic relay system capable of interpreting his responses to a series of electrical inputs, which would in turn interpret these responses, sending them back into the system. Similar experiments in the 1960s by composers and artists such as Alvin Lussier and David Rosenboom uh, were conducted by these composers and artists, but they had focused strictly on the body as an engine of composition using the semi-voluntary bodily functions captured by bioelectric tools like EEG to generate sound. Eaton's vision, however, was to create a system for musical comp composition that would avoid the perennial problem of variable reception and appreciation in listeners by harmonizing the totality of physiological responses, making it possible not only for the comp composer to standardize her or his musical palette, but to also determine the physical and emotional reception of the work. In a self-published 1969 pamphlet, Biomusic, Eaton wrote, quote, through physiological parameter monitoring, biological feedback, and physiological parameter control, we can approach our idea of controlling the uh, psychological, physiological states of a subject in real time, and that we can predict, repeat, and change uh, at will these states in the majority of subjects. The power of such systems is fantastic. The contrast between biomusic and any type of conventional music is startling, exciting. The listener had to be primed to enter into a state amenable to the reception of these exciting states of total physiolog <laughs> physiological and psychological control. And this was to be accomplished by subjecting her to a regime of a regimen of sensory depri deprivation effectuated by electronarcosis. On its surface, the apparatus for Eaton's biomusic was virtually interchangeable with an array of bioelectric and mechanical <coughs> techniques developed by the shadowy governmental programs of the era, 
whose goal was control over the mind of a perfect soldier or a pliable enemy. Aside from the sense authoritarian promise of biomusic, Eaton's project, while more or less wiped from history to the extent that anything can ever be zeroed, is a prescient articulation of our current technostatic moment in that biomusic, as the future of the form, actually represents its extinction. Quote, it is conceivable, this is from Eaton, it is conceivable that music in the future will dispense with sound altogether and become an art induced psychological and physiological states. End quote. So it's remarkably prescient that Eaton saw the, for, foresaw the end of audible music at a time when people still believed that music actually had a future. Or maybe it's more appropriate to say at a time when music still had a futurism. But after decades of earnest experimentation, music hit a wall. The total tonal palette and potentiation of affects have been exhausted by electronic synthesis, free up improvisation, and all the other dead end methods devised to push music ever forward. Music had already been pushed to the limit of intelligibility by Cage, but the limitless stretch of its contours didn't prevent musicians and composers from trying to fill this putatively infinite blank. We tried hard and failed harder to compose and listen without the asinine Dorian quantization. We recorded everything we could, subjected those recordings to every bit of mechanical and al algorithmic alteration we could think of. We made louder music, faster music, we accelerated sensation, hoping to escape the strictures of neoliberalism's genius. But as, Robin James, as musicologist Robin James noted, the intensification of sonic affects was essentially geared towards the production of resilience. James saw resilience as little more than calluses inuring us to the effects of neoliberal capitalism. Given the violence, sexism, racism, and homophobia that this pre-post economic system engendered, calluses offered a buffer but not actual protection. Uh, and allowed us to face over and over the everyday grind, the ever-growing requirements of physical, effective, and precognitive labor that stripped us to the nerve. Even the noises, the glitches, the intensity of unpopular music by the late, nine, by the late tenties uh, had been harnessed <laughs> to fuel the biological, biomusical algorithm. Uh, sorry, I didn't really finish this, actually. <laughs> by the late will, you mean you will not have finished <laughs> <laughs> By the late tenties, had been harnessed to fuel the biomusical algorithm modeled on the late Max Martin's unique neurosignature, his still composing musical mind, which still produces nine out of every ten top stream songs. <laughs> Back in the mid tenties, it shouldn't have come as a surprise that in turning to the most sophisticated machine learning algorithms available at the time, we got more fucking Beatles and Bach. Gimmicky algorithm, gimmicky algorithmic algo music engines like Computozer.com the nadir or algorithm of algorithmic composition offered a dizzying array of complex musical affects such as major, happy, or minor, sad. <laughs> <laughs> Drums and more dissonance were optional. Anyway, what could we have expected? In enlisting powerful computer algorithms to create music, we simply asked them to do what we'd already been doing for decades, averaging and recombining a musical repertoire that we'd stopped believing might ever sound like anything more or less than the oral equivalent of a kaleidoscope pointed at a timeline beginning in 1960 and ending in 1980. By the early 10s, critics such as Simon Reynolds and Mark Fisher were declaring that the future of music was a thing of, of the past, all but forecasting an eternal cultural return without end. This isn't to say that for all the re-re-reincarnations of classical minimalism and neo-neo-soul or the wispy hypnagogic defamiliarizations of 80s New Age, there weren't earnestly ironic and ironically earnest attempts to create the sorts of music that might pass at a club uh, at a club night in the Uncanny Valley, where Turing tested musical systems chomped at the bite to clear the human from their systems. <laughs> Astonishingly, humans in the mid tenties were composing music for more, uh, were, comp were composing music far more machinic than the tunes produced by artificial intelligence. Take, for example, Giant Claw's 2014 pseudo algo master uh, masterpiece, Dark Web. Take it loud. Giant Claw's music failed to be more human, failed to be human even more convincingly than the composition algorithms that threatened to kill off human composers. As, uh, as critic Adam Harper wrote, quote, uh, as critic Adam Harper wrote, quote, if human music were a CAPTCHA, Dark Web would fail it. For those of you old enough to remember CAPTCHAs, the, the joke holds up. <laughs> I promise. But there's, there's an ironic and unsettling observation here. 
that, and remember, this is in the light of the Beatles uh, strumming AI algorithms of the time, it took a human to create music synthetic enough to fail the most rudimentary test of human intelligence. <laughs> the track, um, Trump Mask White Noise by, I have no idea, uh, this is, I think it's pronounced Itaneto no Shi, uh, which translates to internet death, that's the artist, is an even more striking precursor of the emergence of phenomena tech. Cardi, Cardi, give your way. As far as I know, is the only track released under the Internet Death moniker was quickly uploaded, to, was quietly uploaded to the file, site, file sharing site Mediafire. Um, clearly, Trump mask, Trump mask white noise would have dissolved into the entropic expanses of the web. Uh, it's a rather nasty piece of garbage. Were it not for the Trump pence worm that infected millions of computers and online streaming services, disseminated primarily by network garage do or door openers and light bulbs which resulted in the track overwriting every audio file on its host's computer with a copy of the piece. This is the obvious source of the track's notoriety, but what's also important is the way that it fascinated listeners whose iTunes library now consisted mainly, uh, whose, whose iTunes libraries consisted mainly of the sorts of dross that artificial intelligence algorithms evidently had little trouble replacing, replicating. The appeal, as many reported, had to do with the hypnotic quality of the white noise at the tail end of the piece. Musicologists and psychoacousticians were at a loss to explain exactly how what was apparently nothing more or less than broadband white noise could be so appealing. Let's not forget that literal noise had been a part of audible music's palette for decades without gaining much foothold in popular culture. We should also remember that even in its harsher iterations, noise music always incorporated some sort of modulation or subtraction that gave pieces at least a minimal sense of trajectory, uh, manipulations that constrained re uh, reception. For example. I know I'm running kind of short, uh, on time here, so I'll just show you uh, the Mers Bow dress. <laughs> Too uh, In the absence of interviews or any real verifiable information about internet death or the Trump track, myriad rumors that the artist's use of apparently random broadband white noise was in fact a series or an, in an infinitude of meticulously coded transmissions somewhat similar to those transmitted by voice encryption systems developed during World War II by Bell Labs. But while this technology, developed by Homer Dudley in the 1930s, dubbed the vocoder, was intended to encode and conceal one specific message in an unintelligible hiss of white noise, with the objective of its being decoded at the targeted endpoint of reception, Trump masked white noise engendered a seemingly limitless meaningful forms. Short-circuiting the function of noise ascribed by cybernetic discourse, Internet death's missive resonated with the French philosopher Michel Serre's con conception of noises inalienable and fundamental place at the heart of communication, albeit distended to the nth degree. Your noise isn't what that which gives rise to sign signification, is nothing more or less than all signification simultaneously, an infinite multiplicity of, sig of significant singularities. The same critic, Adam Harper, who in the Tentees championed the rise of post-human music, anticipated this possibility in his book, Infinite Music, writing, quote, surely randomized binary code is the freest and most detailed music that there can possibly be. If the goal of composers is to open up the imaginative, imaginative freedom of music space and actualize as much of it as possible, then doesn't randomized white noise, 
which changes its entire structure thousands of times every second, and in which everything, anything is possible, represent this par excellence. Perhaps we should all just listen to white noise forevermore, if it's the richest music there is. So reading Harper's facetious invitation to open the space of music, not just to a theoretical inclusion of any possible sound, but literally all sounds simultaneously, at a generous historicized slant, he finds a striking anticipation of the current order of hyper-possible post-sensory experience. But I can't help but be frustrated by his imagining of infinite possibility, given that the current state of the art, uh, that the current state of the art phenomenon in tech, despite its capacity to offer a vast hyperplicity of sensations, streamlines non-pseudorandom noise into relatively simplistic post-sensory experiences. Every time I jack into Phenomenotech, I'll hope I'll immediately post-sense some, post something new. But on account of this neural worm that I can't, zero, no matter how hard I try, everything I hear sounds like the fucking Beatles. <laughs>